Last words are lasting words. Right? Last words are lasting words. Sometimes last words are so memorable that they motivate new ways of thinking, of being, and of living. Maybe you <clears throat> knew someone who was in your life for a season or for a long time and then they moved far, far away. Do you remember that last visit you had with them in person? And I know it's a time of technology and so we can still reconnect with them, but you may remember that last live conversation. But I think it really comes home if it was someone that you actually lost because they passed. You remember that last conversation that you had with them? how memorable those words were. I'll tell you, it was like it was yesterday. The date was Wednesday, November the 8th. The year was 2000. And this fella here, Mike Van Rees, good friend of Karen's and mine, brother in our church in Guelph, he wired, just the joy connection, he wired all of Lakeside uh, when it was built. He rewired most of the other motels, and he did that all on his dime, he just donated, he was an electrician. Lived in Fergus, and it was a Wednesday evening, it was Awana night. Some of you know what the Awana program is for kids, great program for kids. 20 years ago, a lot of work, a lot of work, but a great program. And uh, I happened to be walking in the side door at the front of the auditorium, and Mike and all his little kids were walking by the back of the auditorium, and he yells up, hi Gord, how are you doing? And I said, I'm doing great, Mike, how are you? And he says, I'm just hanging out with my cubbies. And he walks through. And those were the last words that I would hear Mike say on earth. The next day, November the 9th, he died with a coworker in a workplace accident. He was four years older than me, 41. And a lot I could tell about that story, but uh, even more memorable than his last words to me were the lasting last words and actions toward his wife before he left for work that day. His wife was still in bed, and so he went into the kitchen and he made her a coffee. He brought it to the bedroom, set it on the night table beside her, bent down, gave her a kiss and told her he loved her, and then went off to work. And that morning, he passed. Well, that was Thursday. On the Sunday was the community visit at the funeral home in Fergus. And Karen and I uh, took our eldest two, and we went and we stood in the long line and we hugged Mike's little kids, hugged his dear wife, said goodbye to Mike. It was hard. And as we were leaving, the lineup was longer. It went out the door and across the parking lot. And it was a very cold November 12th. And I've never told this story in public before. It's been 23 years. And I'm not telling this story to toot our horns at all. This is all God. But as we were driving away, we were thinking about Mike's last words and actions toward his wife of making her a coffee and telling her he loved her. And so we looked at each other and we said, man, it's so cold. God's prompting us to go to Timmy's and buy a lot of coffees for those people in the lineup. And we did not care how much it cost. And we just went and got, I don't even remember how many coffees. And we went back and it became this community thing where people were handing out coffees. But why did we do that? It was all because... What Mike did was so memorable. Those last moments were so memorable that it motivated us to a different way of thinking and being and living. And, and I'm telling you, Jesus is the hero in that story because number one, it was his idea and it was his money. It wasn't ours. It was all God. Last words are really memorable. And Paul's last words here in Acts 20 were to these Ephesian church leaders and they were arrestingly memorable. I don't know that Paul intended them to be that, but God's spirit certainly did. These church leaders would never forget 
what they heard that day, the very last time that they would see Paul on this side of eternity. And I hope it motivated them to a new way of thinking and being and living. And I pray that it does the same with us. We actually have two records of Paul's last words in the New Testament. I was noticing that this past week. One in verbal form here in Acts 20 to these church leaders, but one in written form in a letter entitled 2 Timothy to his son in the faith. Timothy, and so that we have as well. But here in Acts 20, these lasting last words are to the elders, the overseers, and the shepherds. And we've seen this already. They're not three distinct groups of leaders in the church. They are one and the same group. And I've been appreciating, in reflecting on the terms, I've been appreciating the terms overseers and shepherds because they're so descriptive of their function, aren't they? An overseer is someone who oversees. A shepherd is someone who shepherds. An elder is not someone who elds. Like, that's pretty sure that's not a thing. Elder doesn't describe a function. It underscores a state of spiritual maturity rather than a function. Now, you say, well, what about character? Are, are there any character and life qualifications necessary for a person to be recognized as an elder, an overseer, a shepherd in a local church? And I'm so glad you asked that question because next Sunday we will take a deep dive into that very topic. That's September 10th. On the following Sunday, September 17th, we'll look into leaders, the leadership structure that's proposed for our local church here at Belmont Village Church. So. Pray for Daniel, who's going to dive into the qualities of an elder and deacon next week. And then uh, Brooke and, and Daniel will talk about uh, the structure in the following week. And we want to create a space for questions about that. So from Sunday, September 17th, until the Wednesday, that's the 20th, we'll have an opportunity to send in questions. So we'll talk about that in the Village News. And through the rest of September into October, there'll be responses provided and hopefully good church community engagement. Now, this will all be going on as we begin to relaunch our new missional families and our discipleship villages in late September, early October. Sound good? A lot going on. So, back to our Acts 20 text. In verses 18 to 24, we've seen that Paul reminded these leaders of his example. His example. But our lives are not a silent movie. Right? They're not all actions and no words. And so, what we're going to see this morning is from 25 to 32, Paul's about to give them his instructions. His instructions. Very memorable Lasting last words. Let's pick it up in the reading from verse 20, 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Isn't it interesting that it's the Holy Spirit that warns him of dangers ahead, and yet he, can, he feels compelled by that same Spirit to go toward the danger. He's going up to Jerusalem. Why? Led by the Holy Spirit. When we get to chapter 21, verse 4, in the city of Tyre, it says of some of Paul's Christian friends, quote, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. H how do we make sense of all of that? Well, I really appreciate something that I heard a pastor named Skip Heidsick say once. He said this, a prediction by the Holy Spirit is not necessarily a prohibition by the Holy Spirit. A prediction is preparation for what's coming. So Paul's spirit is being prepared by God's spirit, but that doesn't mean he's prohibiting from him from doing it. It's like Paul is saying, I don't fully know God's plan. I just see God's hand and he's telling me to go forward. And that's kind of how we live as well, isn't it? I was thinking when we were up at camp and I was actually talking to someone about, you know, clarity for the future and I said, it's like we're looking through a frosty window and that's the language of scripture. But one day, face to face with Jesus, he'll put everything into perfect focus. Right now, it's not. 
Well, verse 25, now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Are these not lasting last words? Like, can you imagine if after our gathering this morning, someone came up to you and said, you're never going to see me again. This is the last time we're going to talk together. Wow, that'd be very memorable. This side of heaven, he's saying. In heaven, they'll see each other again. But this side of heaven, you will never see me again. Pretty memorable and hopefully potentially motivating. Now, before we go on, I, I do want to speak to this statement, preaching the kingdom. What does that mean? Preaching the kingdom. The mission of every Christian and of every Christian church is to declare God's kingship over every facet of life. Jesus is king and he has an already here kingdom and a not yet here kingdom. It's a kingdom that's here spiritually and one day it's going to be here like in a very physical, evidential way. But he is king. And that's the preaching of the kingdom. Well, verse 26. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you. That is very graphic language, right? Have you ever had anyone say to you, I'm innocent of your blood? <laughs> it's very, very serious language. And it's also somewhat metaphoric language. He's saying, I'm not responsible for your death, but he's specifically talking about their spiritual death. Why he uses this physical imagery of blood, we don't know. But he's talking about their spiritual death. And, and why is he innocent of that? Because he says, I declared the full will of God, the full counsel, the gospel of God to you. Now, I, I read this statement of Paul, and, and I'm glad for Paul. There's so much power and freedom in a clear conscience. Would you agree? But it also challenges me. Because over the years, I've known a lot of people in the different neighborhoods we've lived, and I was thinking the other day about who I've felt this toward, and there's at least a half a dozen people that when they died, I felt guilt. Why? Because I didn't share Jesus so clearly with them. Had gospel conversations, but didn't clearly present Jesus. Did others maybe have conversations with them? Yes, I hope so. But I just know that I didn't. And I'll tell you, on the one hand, it's motivated me more with the people I do know. And on the other hand, may I say this, the beauty of the gospel is that I don't live with guilt. I don't have to live with guilt, and neither do you. That today is the first day of the rest of our lives. When I repent, when I ask God for forgiveness from all my sins, but, but as a disciple of Jesus in this one particular area of sin in my life, a sin of omission, that Jesus releases me from the guilt of my past. Do you carry around any guilt for anything? Give it to Jesus. Don't carry it around for another moment. He doesn't want you to. The takeaways here are deal with that guilt through Jesus Christ and two, take the opportunity to share the gospel with people whenever you can. Paul says, I, I, I don't have any guilt about this. I am innocent of your blood. Verse 26, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now what does that mean? Some translations say the whole counsel of God. Well, I will say this. This is one of the reasons that I and that we have been committed to teaching through the books of the Bible, of God's Word. There are 66 of them, so we've got a lot of material to cover, right? And how else can we learn and discern the whole will or the whole counsel of God? And, and I say what I'm about to say, I say this in grace, but over the years people have asked, can, can we talk about prophecy more? And can we talk about relationships more? And can we talk about family more? There's not many who say, can we talk about giving or tithing more? Could we do that? <laughs> we just had a two week series on that. We do talk about all of those things as the whole counsel of God takes us there through the various books. 
of the Bible as we study them together. It's in God's timing and God's emphasis. And I hope that resonates as a good thing with people. Now, beginning at verse 28, this is where the direct instructions begin. Okay, verse 28. Here's the first one. First priority. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Pay careful attention. Keep watch. Notice the order. Keep watch over who first? Yourselves. And then over others. You ever sit on the airplane, and I know most of us don't pay attention when the steward is going through all the pre-flight instructions, right? But what are you supposed to do with the oxygen mask before you help someone else? Put yours on first, and then help someone else with theirs. Watch over yourselves. Now, when we read that, I think my go-to for many, many years was, this is a statement that's about protecting my mind. Bounce your eyes. Essentially, be on guard against sin in our lives. And that's not wrong, but that's also not enough. That's also not enough. First of all, God is not about behavioral modification. Do we, do we agree with that? He's about heart change. So it's not just like, I'm going to do all these protective measures and nothing's really changing in my heart. Those tactics are playing defense. Jesus calls his disciples to play offense. Keep watch actively over yourself by actively preaching the gospel to you, to yourself. I need to gospel my own heart all the time. I'll give you an example. When the enemy says that because I fail at something, which I often do, that makes me a failure. It's in those moments that I need to rehearse to myself that God calls me his adopted child. He calls me his son. If you're a woman who is a believer in Jesus, he calls you his daughter, a daughter of the Most High God. I need to remind myself that God says, I'm family of royalty beyond any kind of royalty on earth. And that as a believer and disciple of Jesus, I am presently sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what scripture says. My position is in Christ wherever he is. None of that adds up to me being a failure. And so I need to proclaim that gospel to me. I I, I learned recently that it takes 10 minutes to establish a new neural pathway in our brains. What is a neural pathway? It's a roadway for thoughts. Um, I've mentioned this before, but they've been reconstructing our street for almost five months now with, with two months to go. Well, it takes between 18 days and 254 days to reconstruct a neural pathway. Some are longer, some are shorter than others, and that's why habits are so so hard to break, because of those neural pathways. But it only takes 10 minutes for a new negative thought roadway, and 10 minutes for a new positive thought roadway to be constructed in our brains. Sit in that for a moment. Do you ever get some negative thoughts about you or about people? We need to shut those down within 10 minutes. (laughs) And that's why scripture says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. See, some of you have been rehearsing lies about you, lies about others, lies about what you believe you can or can't be, what you can or can't do for years. Keep watch over yourselves. 
gospel your heart. Let God establish new neural pathways of truth in your soul. Always be answering the question, what does God say about me? That's priority number one, but priority number two, keep watch over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And this is language right out of Ezekiel. This is a picture of the watchman in the book of Ezekiel. If the watchman didn't give the warning when the enemy was attacking, the blood of the people being attacked was on him, the watchman. And that's what he's saying to these leaders. And isn't this an interesting turn of words here? Paul says, I'm not guilty of blood. Don't you be either. Why? Because someone else's blood was shed for these people. Look what he goes on to say in verse 28. Be shepherds of the church of God, notice this, which he bought with his own blood. (laughs) How precious is the church? What's the value of the church? It's the life of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the value of his beloved bride. Isn't this a staggering comment, though? God's blood. Right? The church of God, which he bought with his own blood. This is God's blood. We sang at youth camp this past week a song that says, Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah, to the son of suffering. Jesus is the God who bleeds. This is another quiet proof in scripture of the deity of Jesus. It really is. But why does the shepherd need to watch? Because of the value of the sheep, Jesus' life, and because of the savagery of the enemy. Look at the next verse, verse 29. I know that after I leave, says Paul, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. He's talking about people. Talking about people. Savage wolves inspired by a spirit that is savage and fierce. A real enemy. Again, this is such graphic language. It's designed to be memorable and motivating to new ways of thinking, being, and living. But this is really interesting. Paul's about to leave. Leadership vacuums are vulnerable places. The church is exposed to danger when there isn't leadership. And one of God's means of protecting his church is leadership. And that's why verse 30 is so heartbreaking and must have broken Paul's heart. Look what he says. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. You know, when I read that, I thought, oh, maybe he's saying from your church number, there will be people who will arise. But the ESV says, from among your own selves will men arise. The NLT, some men from your own group. And if you take a deep dive into the the original language, it's from their leadership. Savage wolves will come. Wow. How striking and memorable are Paul's words. I mean, when it happened in the future, can you not hear the others saying, do you remember Paul said this? He said this would happen. It happened. Men will arise, and the word is distort. Diastropho, to change the shape, to twist, pervert, corrupt, misinterpret. It's somehow worse than blatantly opposing the truth because it's like it borrows the truth and hijacks it and takes it somewhere else. Right? It takes the church off course. Borrowing that airplane imagery, I was thinking about if Brooke and Helen's family flies out this coming week from Kitchener Airport and the pilots just start one degree off course as they head out to Calgary. They might end up in Yellowknife or who knows where. Not their intended destination. Take the truth one degree off course and you won't notice it today or tomorrow or even next week or maybe even next month. But the further you get from ground zero, the more off course the church will be. And you'll land somewhere far, far away from your intended destination. That's what distorting the truth does. Now, it's happening in our culture. 
And no one should expect that it wouldn't. But it's happening in far too many Christian churches today as well. And, and, and here's the thing about distortion. One distortion leads to another distortion. It, it's called, you look on the screen there, the broken window syndrome. Have you heard of that? Uh, do you want to see it in action right now in our city? Uh, drive up Cortland Avenue past the old Snyder's factory right now, and someone evidently threw the first rock. That probably didn't start it. It was the second rock. I remember learning about this in psychology. It's the second rock. And then the flood is on. And as I drove by very slowly last week, I counted every window but three were broken. And so if you hurry after church, you can go over and finish them off if you, <laughs> if you want. But it's almost like there's permission. One distortion, one twisting of scriptural truth, and you're on a slippery slope to a broken window, window syndrome. And that's why Hebrews 2 and 1 says, we must pay the most careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from the truth. So keep watch. But then look at instruction number three. Very similar to instructions one and two, a little bit different slant though. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Why? Because there is a real, legitimate enemy at work. Like he's real. Behind everything physical, there is a spirit. There is spiritual. God is spirit. Satan is spirit. Angels, demons. We have a spirit. Spirit is behind it. And so we need to guard and guide the sheep. And so he's telling these leaders to do that. I think most of us have heard Psalm 23. Remember how it ends? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, how does a rod and a staff comfort the sheep? The staff guides the sheep. That's the, that's the shepherd's hook, and it guides the sheep, directs the sheep. The rod guards the sheep. How does it guard it? By smacking the sheep? No. By smacking the predator. That's why the shepherd has a rod, to smack the predator. And you know, I think Jesus goes even a step further as the great shepherd. He says, I am the door of the sheep. He, he, he puts the sheep in a pen and he lies down to be the door. So he's got the staff, he's got the rod, and him, his own life he'll lie down for his sheep, his church. But I gotta tell you, this last sentence here has been the most convicting in this passage for me personally. Because I have not shed tears enough as I think of you. You deserve that all of your leaders would care this much for your spiritual welfare. He says he, 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 he had tears night and day for three years. The beautiful thing is that Paul knows that it's not all on him. In fact, look what he says next, verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Wow. Wow. Paul can confidently leave knowing that he's committing them, even though he knows savage wolves are going to come in. Ultimately, he believes there will be victory through God's grace. That's what he's saying. And I commit you to God and the word of his grace. And look what God's grace can do. It can build us up. It can strengthen us against the enemy, and it can give us ultimately an inheritance in eternity with all those who are set apart for him. Why wouldn't we want to know a God of grace like this? Verse 33 and 34, it's interesting that he, he, he inserts this. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. So many leaders have gone astray in this area, haven't they? Finances, this love for money. Paul is saying to them, focus on ministry, not on money. Focus on people, not on, not on things. Do the work of the ministry. Verse 35, in everything I did, I showed you, again, his example, that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. God cares about people on the margins, and so must we. 
Because that same Jesus living in Paul is living in us. The rest of verse 35, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So I went looking. Where did he say this? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's not there. So Jesus said this, but it's not in any of the Gospels. And yet, I thought of John 21, verse 35, where John says, Jesus did many other things as well if every one of them were written down. I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So Jesus said a whole lot of other things that God's Spirit evidently told Paul that he said, and one of them was, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let God's Spirit teach you, teach me what that means. Let's, let's conclude these last three verses. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. This is a tender moment, isn't it? How memorable would that last moment be, them all kneeling down to pray? They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again, this side of eternity. Then they accompanied him to the ship. You know, I thought kind of humorously, which is better, that people would weep when you arrive or when you leave? I think it's better that they weep when you leave, not when you arrive. That's a problem. Because of time, I have one takeaway. Just one takeaway. Every time we leave someone's presence, we never know if that'll be the last time. We don't. We leave an impression. By God's Spirit, is it a memorable one in such a way that motivates people to think differently, be different, and live in a new way? A way that is kingdom-focused, kingdom-minded. Well, how can we do that? Let it be an impression of Jesus. Let it be an impression of Jesus. Like, let that be what guides every interaction that you have. Let Jesus out of the cage, let him live through you, live through me, and we'll leave an impression of Jesus. And as we think of communion, how can we not think of Jesus' last words and actions? Before he left his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. And they had no idea where he was going from within the Passover meal. Why was he doing this? And he said, this is my body that's given for you. It's about to be broken for you. Keep doing this to remember me. And then he took the, the cup, one of the cups of the Passover Seder, and he said, and this cup of wine, this is my blood that I'm about to shed for you. Keep doing this to remember me. And over 2,000 years later, that's what we have the privilege of doing today. We get to remember, because we're motivated by the memorable last words and actions of Jesus before he went to the cross and his last words and actions were, it is finished. I've paid for it all. All I have for you now is grace. Come as you are. And he died. And he rose again, and he says, go and make disciples, because I'm coming back. A lot of last words of Jesus. They're never, ever over <laughs> with Jesus. He'll keep speaking for eternity. But as we think of this moment of communion, let's, let's pray and just quiet our hearts and reflect on, on him. God, as I thought of praying about communion now. My mind went to you on the cross, Jesus, and on the right hand and on the left were sinful people. And just hours before, your own disciples had come to you and said, hey Jesus, could one of us be on the right hand and on the left hand with you in your kingdom? God, forgive us that so often in our pride, we think that we deserve somehow to be on your right hand or on your left in your kingdom. But what we really deserve is to be on your right hand or your left at Calvary. 
But Lord, those thieves, while they do represent us, God, we transfer our minds and our whole beings onto you, Jesus, on the cross, because that's where we were when you absorbed all of our sin. You carried it in your own body on the tree, and you paid it in full. And we are forgiven fully, fully through that cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your last words and your last actions to satisfy the holiness of God and to forgive unholy people like us. And so, Lord, we take this, these emblems this morning with incredible gratitude and hope and joy for what you did on our behalf. And our response is, here's my life. May I think differently be different, and live differently. All for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.